<laughs> okay, so the, the final speaker of this morning's session is from Walter Sinan. He's going to tell us about scaling similarity in large and quantum mechanics. Okay, well, I thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me. And so we'll uh, be discussing... Uh, doesn't advance. Okay, let me see. Um, okay. Okay. So the duality between ADS5 and S5, so, uh, and be between ADS5 and S5 and super young mills, uh, can be obtained by taking the near horizon limit of D3 brains in 10 dimensions. So, um, of course, uh, one could wonder what uh, happens if you take the near horizon limit of DP brains for P different from 3. And we've known for a long time that uh, we also get a duality between uh, super young mills theory with 16 supercharges and some geometry, but the theory is not uh, scale invariant. Um, and in the gravity, in the gravity limit, the solution is uh, very simple. So we have a geometry, for example, in Einstein frame or string frame, which is uh, conformal to ADS, uh, ADS times S, so somewhat similar to what happens in previous cases, except that there is conformal means that there is an overall factor that depends on the radial direction, and also the dilaton depends on the radius. Um, now, you can ask, uh, why are we returning to this topic? And for me, the, the main reason is um, that the D0 brain case is particularly interesting because this matrix model is somehow the simplest uh, quantum mechanical theory. Um, by quantum mechanical simplest theory, what I mean is as opposed to a quantum field theory that has uh, more, well, it uh, has UV divergences and it's more complicated. So it's the simplest quantum mechanical theory that has a bulk Einstein gravity dual, where in the bulk we have uh, a local theory, like Einstein theory, as opposed to some weirder theory like uh, higher spin gravity or, or, or some other thing like that. Um, and also in the, in the last few years, there have been very interesting uh, numerical simulations of this theory at finite temperature. Um, and uh, so this is uh, the latest, uh, Mon this has been done by Monte Carlo simulations by uh, these people. So I, I cited here two papers. There, there are more than, there are several, many papers by various combinations of authors. Um, and what they have done is they've uh, numerically, they, they've done a lattice regularization of the theory on a circle, and they've uh, computed the energy, the thermal energy at finite temperature. From here you can calculate the other thermodynamic observables, and uh, they found this, uh, this nice curve. And so this is the result of the numerical calculations, and you can compare that to the gravity answer. And um, so they, they are different because at uh, very high temperatures, the gravity theory is not applicable, as, as we will discuss in a second, uh, but they start agreeing uh, when you are at the lowest temperatures. And this is really a fit. This is really an agreement that involves no free parameters. You know the normalization of both curves and so on. And um, yeah, the units are uh, so th this theory has a dimensionful constant, uh, which is the Toft coupling is dimensionful, and it, it's been set to one. So, uh, so the if, if you define. Uh, G squared, well, anyway, so some definition of this kind. Um, um, the yellow line is a fit. So the yellow line is a fit, actually, to, so it's a fit that assumes, um, yeah, maybe that point, about, let, let me answer the question about the yellow line in a second. Um, so something interesting about this is that this is uh, one of uh, three ways I know of calculating black hole entropy. So one is uh, using so, so there are many calculations that calculate black hole entropy from um, some microscopic theory uh, that use basically three techniques in general. So one uh, uses uh, supersymmetry or, you know, Strominger Buffa were the first to do that. Uh, then uh, you could also use the Cardi formula. So that uh, works very well in ADS3 or related to ADS3. And the third is this one. So doing a numerical calculation. Um, Okay, so, um, so, sorry, I need to go back. Um, 
Now, the yellow curve. So the yellow curve is, um, is a fit, uh, assuming you have uh, the gravity answer plus some alpha prime corrections that are expected to have a particular power law dependence in the temperature. Um, that, that is set by, well, the, the, the scaling of alpha prime and so on, um, but with a known coefficient. So you can do that, this fit with a known coefficient and you get the yellow curve. And as a bonus, you get the uh, coefficients of, the, um, of these R to the fourth corrections. So they uh, computed, the, for example, the eight derivative corrections at uh, three level and one loop level. So once you so supergravity, of course, in string theory is, uh, well, you have the two derivative action, but then you get further corrections, further alpha prime corrections uh, that will correct the free energy of this, uh, of this theory. And, um, and after you integrate them uh, and, and so on, you'll, you'll get some numbers. Um, and unfortunately, we cannot calculate the answers uh, at uh, tree level. Uh, because we don't know the full r, the full r to the fourth or eight, deriva eight derivative term as a function of these uh, three kinds of fields. So, uh, and uh, so we don't know how to do this analytically, how to compare to an analytic answer here. Uh, fortunately, the loop level is actually uh, simpler to compute, and there is actually you can compute it theoretically, and you can compare it to the to the answer, and you get the right the right answer. Um, but anyway, I'm saying this because they, they are really more advanced than the analytic computations. So there, there is something that they, they found that uh, we cannot reproduce analytically. Okay. Um, so it's similar to this uh, localization computations where you, know, you get some answer from localization, then you start comparing to gravity. By doing this. Here they do numerical calculation, and then we need to compare to gravity and see, see what we get. Um, now, also in the in the more distant future, it might be that this model might be the simplest uh, model to have a quantum simulation of some model that again has a gravity dual. Um, so there, there are simpler models where um, the, the, they don't have a very clear gravity dual like SYK. Um, that, um, but this is one in which uh, you really have a bulk graviton, a bulk local theory, and uh, maybe you could simulate it in the future, and you. If you look at the previous uh, calculations, so these calculations uh, were done for a, num a number n that was roughly 16, uh, and a certain number of, uh, um, yeah, and a certain temperature and so on. And you can translate that into a number of qubits that you would need for your quantum simula simulation to at least reproduce their answer. So we know, we know from, their, from their numerical calculations that there is a certain value of n and a certain temperature and so on, where we, there is some agreement with gravity. So you, we know that if we have a certain, that translates into a certain number of qubits, uh, that is roughly the minimum you, you would need to start seeing the, this agreement with gravity. And that number, if you calculate it, is similar to the number that you need to factor la large integers. So quantum computers are supposed to factor la large integers and supposed to break the codes and so on. So by the time they break codes, they will also be able to simulate this model. Um, so it's, it's a number of about uh, maybe 7,000 or 10,000 qubits. Uh, this is uh, without error correction, of course. Um, um, OK, so let me discuss in more detail. So with this, this was a motivation. So now let me review uh, a little more the holography for DP brains. So we have a gravity solution, which as we said, this is just in formulas, what I stated before, that there is some power of C here. Uh, there is some other power of C with some exponents. Um, you can uh, figure out what these exponents are. Um, and uh, then uh, an interesting property of this, uh, of this type of solutions is that they have a <coughs> so-called scaling similarity. So if you rescale all the coordinates uh, in this way, then the factor within brackets, as usual, is uh, invariant, but the metric uh, changes by an overall factor. And the dilaton also changes by an overall factor. And um, then that implies, ends up implying that the action uh, will also change by an overall factor. Okay? So the action uh, gets rescaled. Um, and yes? This is, this is at the two-derivative level. If you include higher 
corrections, like these alpha prime corrections we were discussing, they do not respect this symmetry. So this is, uh, well, it's not really a symmetry, it should be called a similarity. Let me have. So a similarity is something that uh, is a transformation that rescales the action. Um, and for that reason, it's a symmetry of the equations of motion, but not the symmetry of the action. So in particular, uh, it's not the symmetry of the quantum theory, for, because for the quantum theory, you really need to know the normalization of the action. But in the string theory context, even at the level of alpha prime corrections, it's not, a sim it's not a, even a similarity. Okay. What? Uh, no, it just it just doesn't work. So um, because the, the transformation here is already fixed, so you, uh, well, at least uh, I, I don't think you could uh, have something that would work. Um, well, m m maybe maybe you figure out a way that it could work, but at least I, I couldn't think. Um, um, okay, very good. So and and this is uh, this is common for simple mechanical systems. Like uh, let's say when you have two powers, you can always adjust the rescaling of x so that this whole thing gets rescaled by constant. And as a simple application, uh, you can work this out for n equal to minus 1, and uh, then you get the usual Kepler law as the r relationship between the size and the period of the orbit, for example. Um, OK, I, I guess I should have emphasized that uh, this notion of similarity is something that is associated to a particular classical limit. So it's a property of the classical action. If you have a quantum theory in deep in the quantum regime, where you can't uh, really tell whether it does or does not have this uh, property. But if there is a, a, a classical limit, and in our, the gravity case, the classical limit is the Larsen limit, then you can talk about it. Now, just this transparency here is just to remind you the regime of validity of these solutions. Uh, the solution, the gravity solution, is valid in some range of uh, radial directions and which corresponds to a certain range of energy scales. Uh, the curvature blows up near the, near the boundary, and near the interior, the dilaton becomes large, and you have to do something else. So the green region is where you have the green light to uh, apply that gravity solution. Um, if we consider black holes, then, um, then the black hole horizon, if the black hole horizon could be anywhere along this line, depending on the temperature, but if you adjust, let's say, the inverse temperature so as to be within the green region, uh, then uh, the geometry ends here, and you have um, you, you, you can calculate, uh, for example, the entropy of this black hole in a regime where you can uh, really trust it, okay? Uh, because it's the area at that point. Um, and so, for that range of temperatures, then uh, you can trust the gravity solution. You'll have the scaling uh, similarity, and the, the fact that the action gets rescaled with the power theta implies that the uh, the action, or well, the the, the log of c, uh, also proportional to the entropy, will uh, have this form. So it will have so b times uh, t to the p would be the naive answer if you had scale invariance, but then you have this additional uh, exponent. Okay, um, and this is an exponent that we got from the gravity solution, from the scaling of the solution. Uh, The separation between, uh, yeah, yeah, very good. So, so the the theory, uh, these theories have a scale, um, and so there's only one scale in the problem. And the fact that this this there is a green region at all is due to n. So the as, as you're saying, so uh, for large n there is a big green re green re region. If n was let's say two, you wouldn't have a green region at all. Um, um, okay. Now, we said that there was a scaling symmetry, so, so the, the similarity of the action implies a symmetry of the equations of motion, and you can use it to classify the small fluctuations around uh, this equation. And um, it turns out that as a separate trick, uh, it's useful to view these backgrounds as coming from, uh, as coming from dimensional reduction from ADS p plus theta times s, 8 minus p. So th this, is, this is simply because these theories have uh, this varying dilaton. And so you can think of the dilaton as coming from dimensional reduction of some higher dimensional space. This is something that essentially had to work, and uh, indeed uh, does work, as uh, shown by Costas and uh, friends. Um, 
Okay, so the, the reason I'm mentioning it is because it, this sometimes uh, simplifies the calculation also that we are going to define the scaling dimensions of the operators to be basically what they would have from the, di it's analogous to the dimensions they would have in this, uh, in this language. We don't have to use this language, we could, uh, we could just remain in the 10 dimensional discussion and define uh, the scaling dimensions in that way. But just to connect it to something you already know, I'm mentioning uh, this idea's connection. Um, okay, sorry, I repeated the slide. Um, so now, the, the spectrum of uh, dimensions uh, of operators, normally it's uh, difficult to, somewhat difficult to find, so you have to take the action, consider the small fluctuation, diagonalize everything, and so on. Uh, however, there is a, a simple, uh, simple way to understand uh, where they come from, and this arises as follows. First, you notice that at the level of gravity, you can use dualities to relate all these backgrounds to a certain plane wave in 11 dimensions. So this uh, plane wave solution in 11 dimensions. Um, then, uh, if you consider uh, operators like perturbations that are, let's say, non-normalizable far away, so they are and here, far away from uh, the center of this plane wave, you just have simply flat space. So sim these are just simply perturbations around flat space. You have the usual solutions of the Laplace equation, right? Some powers of uh, y to the l, where these are symmetric polynomials. Um, so you know how they scale with l. Um, and then tracking the action of that uh, similarity transformation that we discussed. So there was a similarity transformation in the original background. That translates into a combination of rescaling of y's and rescaling of x and, and a boost in the x plus x minus plane. And so that's the action of the uh, similarity transformation, which um, if we find how the field rescales under that similarity, that we find the, its dimension, right? So here we uh, track, down, track that down. I'm not uh, showing you the details, but it's uh, relatively straightforward by knowing how the rescaling was working in the in the other frame. Um, then you find this very simple formula for the dimensions, uh, which um, say that the dimensions involve the power of y the, of the corresponding field, uh, and also the boost eigenvalue of the field in the x plus and x minus direction. And the reason that these two numbers appear is, is simply that that original similarity involved the rescaling, a combination of rescaling y and a boost in the x plus and x minus directions. Um, and so here B is, uh, so th th this depends, for example, if we are expanding some field, you just have to know how many plus indices or minus indices they have, and then you would know uh, what this boost eigenvalue is, okay? Um, so, yeah, so and this uh, then gives the formula which is analogous, well, in the particular case of ADS5, it gives you the formula for all the dimensions in ADS5, uh, but uh, this applies also to the other cases. Uh, this, uh, Remarkable, simply form, simple formula. Um, now, one interesting question that we can answer with this formula is uh, the following. So, suppose that uh, we want to, uh, to simulate this uh, quantum mechanical theory, and uh, we want to do it at uh, very, very low temperatures. And so, we, one question is uh, how many relevant operators that th does this theory has have? So if we want to regulate it with a lattice or whatever, uh, you will you will induce some relevant deformation. You might induce some relevant deformations, and you you are asking how much fine tuning do you need to do to get to this uh, model. Um, and um, so at at weak coupling, uh, so in the UV, any power of x has negative dimensions. So we have an infinite number of negative of uh, relevant perturbations. However, when we are at strong coupling, many of these operators get large dimensions, and in particular, you saw the formula for the dimensions that we had, they were all positive. And, and then, uh, so you can, you can see that, that uh, there are no, for example, SO9 invariant, uh, SO9 invariant single trace relevant operators in the, um, in, in, in the this, is, uh, this also happens in n equal to four super young mills, for example. So at, um, at weak coupling, we had the operator trace phi square, the so-called Konishi operator. So that's uh, relevant at weak coupling, but at strong coupling, it's not uh, relevant. It's irrelevant. Now, in this in this theory, we could also have some SO9 singlets, like uh, double trace operators. So I, I shall show you how 
you compute the dimension, so you use the previous formula. So the previous formula uh, for these operators would give a dimension of uh, 2 over 5 for each of them. Um, and then, um, um, sorry, uh, and then, um, so 2 over 5 times the angular momentum, which is 2, and then 2 because we get, there are two operators, so we get 8 over 5. And uh, 15 over 5 is what it would need to, to be in order to be, um, to be marginal, right? That's roughly the same condition that we would have if we were in ADS, that they higher dimensional ADS. That's why that ADS picture is good to have in mind. But uh, you can derive that this is a, the condition whether to be relevant or irrelevant in the independently of connecting that to that ADS condition. Anyway, so, uh, so these are the, con the, na the coefficients that you should be fine-tuned in order to simulate this model at uh, very low energies. Um, now, at, black temp uh, at finite temperatures, also it's useful to use that uh, ADS picture because you can, uh, you can now have the black brain. And once the spectrum of fields is fixed, you can then uh, write the wave equations uh, around that black brain and get the uh, quasi-normal modes, for example. And so we did that in our paper. And um, the quasi-normal modes give you the, a simple response of the black hole, and something uh, purely Lorentzian, that if you were to, let's say, simulate uh, this model, this would be like a very simple observable to, uh, for which we have a prediction from gravity. Um, um, OK, so uh, another question I would like to discuss is whether we can, have, we can determine the scaling similarity exponent uh, directly from the yam mill side without using gravity. Okay, um, and the idea is that we can do that by performing a supersymmetric protected computation uh, that is uh, also valid at strong coupling. And so this uh, can be done in two ways. So one possibility is to consider uh, the motion of uh, brains in the moduli space approximation, or more precisely, the multi-center solutions um, in the the slow approximation, then uh, we know that uh, the action for such uh, motions, uh, the coefficient of the x dot squared uh, is 1. It has absolutely no corrections. And the coefficient of x to the fourth, the x to the fourth term cons consists only of a one-loop correction that we can calculate. And then this should be valid at any value of the coupling. Okay. Um, and then uh, you can uh, check that this action has a similarity with an exponent, which is the same as the, uh, as the, similar, the, the exponent we had in uh, the gravity solution. So, and of course, we could also get this directly from the gravity solution by thinking about multi-center solutions. So we had to have that, that exponent. So that's a way to compute uh, the exponent uh, from, the, fr from, uh, from this action. Um, this exponent was discussed before in uh, these papers using somewhat uh, similar logic, but I think the argument uh, I'm giving here is a little more transparent and clear. Um, and the other method is uh, something that was done by Nikolai and friends, uh, which is to think about uh, partition the sphere partition functions in these uh, theories. And it turns out that the sphere partition functions at strong coupling, they have also a power law behavior which, of course, is uh, consistent with the similarity. Uh, and not only that, but they can compute uh, from a localization formula uh, what this power is. And it uh, indeed agrees with, with gravity, with the gravity answer. Um, um, OK, so now we'll, uh, in the rest of the talk, we'll switch uh, to a slightly different problem, so different uh, Lagrangian. Um, and what follows is based on on work in progress with Anna Biggs and Vladimir Noroblansky. And the idea is the following. So you probably heard about the SYK model. So it's a model which is a quantum mechanical theory, which develops a nearly scale invariant behavior at low energies. And so one question we had uh, was whether there was an SYK-like model that develops a scaling similarity at low energies. So that is more similar to, let's say, BFSS or this, this zero brain matrix model. And um, so we are studying such a model, and I will tell you a little bit about, uh, about this model, about the peculiarities of this model. Now, it turns out that this is a model that uh, had already been considered before as a model for black holes. It featured in, uh, 
in this paper by Aninos, uh, Anos, and Deneff. And in fact, they had this model with disorder and so on even before the SYK became uh, popular in our field. Um, and we would consider here a slightly simplified version of the model they had. Uh, so this is uh, the model. Uh, we have a supersymmetric quantum mechanics uh, with a bunch of fields and a superpotential. Um, there are two versions of the model, one with n equal to 2 and one with n equal to 4 supersymmetry. So that means two supercharges and four supercharges in total. Um, the model has um, a scalar superfield, so it has uh, dynamical bosons and fermions, um, and a superpotential, which in the simplest interacting case is uh, cubic, let's say, with random couplings, and these couplings have uh, are drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So they have they're all independently uh, random couplings. Uh, in this model, phi is real. In this model, phi is complex, um, and so these j's are also complex in this model. And we can have here degree three or degree q in general. So there is a, a version of this model with the degree q. So this is similar to the standard SYK. Previously, we had considered a, a uh, an n equal to 2 model, uh, but which con had only fermions. This model is different because it has dynamical bosons and fermions. Okay, so that's the model. Um, I hope it's clear. So we'll be studying this model and seeing w what, what happens with it. So we'll mainly discuss the n equal to 2 model, because the other one is almost uh, identical at the level of the large n equations. We'll, we'll discuss a few differences later, but for the moment they are more or less the same. Um, now, in order to uh, analyze this model, it's convenient to think about the uh, two-point functions of the basic fields. So the basic fields are the bosons, uh, the fermions, and we can also, it's also convenient to introduce a two-point function of the auxiliary fields. So that's all the members of the supermultiplet. Uh, in general, these are functions of two times, and one can write down uh, some equations uh, for this function. So there are Schwinger-Dyson equations for these functions that close, and I'll, I'll put them in the next slide, and um, we can be used to determine completely these correlators. Um, in particular, we'll consider translation invariant solutions, time translation invariant solutions, which are functions of uh, just uh, one variable. So the large n equations are the following. So first, uh, we have some e we have a bunch of equations which are just simply the definition of what we call the self-energy, so the one particle irreducible diagrams. Um, this is just a definition. They are defined in Fourier space, just Fourier transforming the functions we had before. Uh, and then uh, in uh, a certain large n approximate, when n is large, it turns out that you can then determine the self-energies in terms of the functions you originally had, so, so that the equations just close and you only have to determine these functions g and nothing else. Um, so these, these equations are in, in time, so there, there is a time dependence on the left and on the right. So one equation is simple in Fourier space, the other is simple in time, and you, uh, by doing, let's say, Fourier transforms between one and the other, you can uh, try to iteratively solve the equations. Uh, you could solve them either numerically or analytically. So they have a very similar structure to the SYK equations. So the SYK equations are basically the same thing, but with only one type of function. Here we have uh, three types. Um, um, now, there is, a, there is a simple way that, uh, for example, in SYK, people analyze these, these equations at low energies, which is to assume a conformal ansatz. So you say, well, g uh, scales like t to some power, and then uh, you insert uh, those functions in the equations we had before, and you determine the power. So in our case, uh, so it's natural to assume that g of phi goes like uh, some power. But then at short times, we expect that the functions um, are related by supersymmetry. And that supersymmetry relations imply that the powers of the other functions are, are syndicated here. This just comes from the fact that two supercharges, so to go from here, so two phi's to two psi's, we act twice with a supercharge and twice with a supercharge if we're roughly like, trans like a derivative, and that's why we have one more power and so on. Um, so if you do this, then uh, you find in certain equations that delta is equal to zero, if, if it's just matching the powers of time. 
But then you also find that some coefficients are infinite, like the coefficient of this one, for example, is infinite. So you, you don't get something uh, reasonable if you, uh, if you just do this. OK, so that, that, that doesn't quite work. Um, now, it turns out that these equations that we are discussing were, in fact, analyzed uh, in, in a different paper by Lin, Xiao, uh, Wang, and Yin um, as an approximation to a different model. So they uh, were studying a different model that was also motivated by BFSS. Uh, it was some uh, particular uh, gauge theory. And they made a, a truncation of the equations of that theory to uh, this, uh, these equations here. And then they analyzed them in great detail. Um, so quite a non-trivial analysis. They did some analysis at low temperatures. And they found that uh, log offset uh, went, uh, well, was behaving in this way. And in fact, uh, we, we, did, we noticed this result. And that's what motivated us to uh, find, uh, find this SYK model where, where those equations would be the actual equations, not, not just uh, an uncontrolled approximation. Um, so I, I will now uh, give you uh, oh, one thing we did was to um, so th they they just made some guesses of how the function should scale and then they consistently determined uh, this power. Uh, but just to check that, we uh, numerically simulated these equations. Um, well, we numerically solved these equations, and uh, we found that it agrees with their, agrees pretty well with their answer. Um, so at, at small, at um, large, high temperatures, the, their analysis is not valid. And we find something else. And we found the interpolation also to, to the high temperature analysis, which is uh, simpler. It's simpler to, to, do the, to analyze this model at high temperatures. Because if you have simply, uh, simply a, a quantum, well, some quantum mechanical model with a potential at high temperatures, just the field starts oscillating and so on. And you can neglect the bosons and apply, let's say, classical thermodynamics. And, uh, and get the behavior at, short, at high temperatures. So now we are, we are trying to understand this model better and uh, see whether indeed this plays the scaling similarity. And as part of this process, uh, we developed a better understanding of their approximation, which I'll now try to explain to, to explain the physics of this model. So, um, so the idea is to take the functions g and um, Remember, these were functions of time, could be real time or Euclidean time. And the idea is that there is a time-independent piece that uh, is very large, and then a time-dependent part that is, uh, is relatively small. So you can think of that as some constant large value, and then some small fluctuations around that large value. Um, and then we can take the effective action from where, from where those equations we wrote uh, come, and then we just expand uh, that action. Um, I, I haven't written the action, but one of the terms in that action is an integral over time of uh, this the product of some functions. And then when you expand uh, in small fluctuations, uh, you find that uh, there is a quadratic term, um, and then there are some higher order terms. Okay? Um, and so the advantage is now that uh, the, you can solve exactly the theory with just the quadratic terms, and then uh, you find uh, some simple answer that will depend on the um, on the value of the constant term, and um, then you can take into account perturbatively the higher order terms, and the higher order terms give you a different power of the function g, and so now uh, we can you can minimize extremize the action, yeah, minimize this well, maximize this quantity, and um, and get uh, the value of g, and that determines uh, g. Beta only appears here. And uh, from this, you can find the power of t that they, they had. Right? So at this level, at this, at this level of the effective action, uh, you see that you have uh, well, the scaling similarity in a rather trivial way, because you can, uh, when you have only two powers, you can always adjust the scaling of the function g so that, uh, so that this is, uh, has a similarity. Um, so yes, please. No, no, I, I'll discuss a little bit uh, later what the interpretation is. So, so far, the, we were drawn to this model. But the motivation to study this model was first that uh, it, it was somebody studied the equations of motion and, and uh, found uh, pow funny power law. 
um, that suggested similarity. The second is that the model had already been proposed uh, uh, for describing black holes, um, in particular the fragmentation of black holes and so on. Um, and so, yeah, th those are two motivations to study this model. Um, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, th this is this is an SYK model where the um, where everything goes like n. So there are basically n degrees of freedom. Um, yeah, there is no claim that this is the same as uh, a matrix model or that would have a string dual. Uh, the best you could hope is that it has some strongly coupled dual somewhat similar to the SYK model. Okay? We'll discuss whether that's the case or not later. Oh. So the, the, the main reason to study this is just to study something that uh, is simpler as SYK but has some of the properties of the FBFSS. Okay? In particular, this new, this other realization of the scaling symmetry. Uh -huh. um, now, one uh, feature that we also found was that there was this uh, constant term which suggests uh, a ground state entropy. Um, now, the question is uh, whether these ground state entropies are rising from BPS states in this model or not. And for that, uh, one can look at the index uh, for this model. And you can uh, compute the index for this n equal to 2 case, and we seem to find zero. We, we, did, we don't have a full argument, but we, uh, we think it's zero. Um, and then we have for n equal to 4, then yeah, we, we know for sure that it's 2 to the n for q equal to 3, or more generally, there is a non-zero value of the index uh, that agrees with the uh, ground state entropy that we, we computed just right now. Um, now that OK. Um, now the question is uh, whether we can say a little more about the interpretation of what's going on uh, with this model is. So one uh, passing feature of this model is that as you go to low temperature, this uh, function g is uh, growing. That's saying that uh, the expectation value of phi squared is growing, for example. So wh why is it growing if we had a positive, you know, well-defined potential and so on? I, this was initially puzzling for us. So. For orientation, we'll consider the q equal to 2 case, which uh, is exactly solvable. So this is the model with a quadratic potential. So a quadratic potential means that we simply have a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And we can diagonalize the mass matrix of, uh, so, so with a random mass matrix, we can just diagonalize it. And if we diagonalize it, we get the distribution of uh, possible masses or frequencies for these oscillators. And if we're interested that interested uh, in the problem at low frequencies, then we'll have uh, we'll concentrate on the low mass oscillators or low frequency oscillators, and uh, they would have a constant uh, distribution as a function of frequency, and that constant distribution is the same as what we had, what we would have as the density of states of a one plus one dimensional field. So the answer we get in this approximation is the same as what we would get for a one plus one dimensional field, where the log of the partition function is proportional to temperature. That would be like the length. The length is just one over the length is the uh, spacing between the eigenvalues. And in this case, uh, then the spacing would be of order 1 over n, right? set by also the typical mass scale m that we have. Um, so that's what we have in this case. Um, let's see, why are they not advancing? OK. Um, yeah, so, um, so in this case, we can go back. We can follow the same procedure of fixing this uh, constant value. So w w from the oscillators, we get uh, this, which is completely independent of g bar. And when we calculate the action as a function of g bar, we find that it's extremized, so it's uh, maximized when g bar goes to infinity. So again, uh, we got that the expectation values of phi was going to infinity. So wh what's uh, going on in this case? Well. What happens is uh, the following. So naively would say that um, you, have, you have some very small eigenvalues uh, of size of order 1 over n. And so you could have uh, fluctuations. So some of the directions in the potential are not very suppressed, so they can have very large eigenvalues. Now in this case, there is something even worse that happens, which is that we are averaging over the couplings. We are averaging over this uh, couplings j. And so when you are, are averaging over j, there is a, a region of this average where uh, phi square is diverging. So actually, the expectation value over the couplings of phi square is actually infinite. Okay? So for fixed couplings, it would be finite. And 
of order n, but uh, when you average over couplings, it, it turns out to be infinite. And that's what we are having, what we are seeing previously. OK, now the situation is a bit different for q bigger than 2. Um, in that case, um, so for q equal to 3, uh, we, we, we can think, so we, we discuss our expansion as taking the, this function g and expanding, but we can think of it more microscopically as saying that we have uh, a field phi which uh, takes a constant value that uh, corresponds to some direction along the potential where the potential is very flat, plus some small fluctuations around that constant value. Um, and then um, if we expand the superpotential, then if this phi bar is a very flat direction, there is nothing contributing from there. But there is, uh, when we expand to second order, there will be effectively some masses uh, for these small fluctuations, uh, which uh, will be random and whose scale will be fixed by uh, the va this constant value. Okay, so then uh, then we see that we get uh, precisely th this term, which is similar to what we had before for uh, the quadratic problem, where instead of the mass m that we had before, we have something that is proportional uh, to this value phi. Okay or more precisely, the, the square of phi, which is g bar. Um, OK. Um, now, um, so this, this term is such that uh, it, uh, it's, it's maximized when g is very small. So this, this fact that uh, for, for, for higher order potentials, you have, um, well, that, that pushes the, the the expectation value of phi to, to small value, right? So it prevents uh, these diversions that we had in the q equal to 2 case. So this q bigger than 2 case is more well defined. We find uh, indeed that this um, it, it, it's pushed down basically because the free energy is, uh, is bigger the smaller the mass of the harmonic oscillators, the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. So it prefers small frequencies for a given temperature. Um, of course, this uh, potential that uh, draws the field down is uh, temperature dependent. So as you go to low temperatures, this potential becomes weaker. And that's the origin of uh, these larger webs that we had, uh, growing webs with temperature. Um, so this uh, is just the result of the quadratic theory. And then if uh, we consider the higher order terms, we get the stabilizing uh, potential term. Um, forwards. Now, one comment is uh, that because the model is so close to quadratic, uh, we expect uh, no chaos or black hole-like behavior, so in answer to the question you were asking. So this intended to be a model that was closer to, let's, let's say, somewhat similar to the D-zero brain, but what we are finding after analyzing the model is that uh, it's very close to quadratic and most likely will not have chaos, for example, which is a signature, maximal chaos, which is a signature of black holes. Um, so in some sense, I find this a bit uh, disappointing conclusion. So we did all this work analyzing this model, but uh, uh, well, it, it, it's not, I think it's not a good model of black holes, at least in the phase where they are somewhat, where you have strong, strongly coupled behavior. But well, at least we understood something. We understood uh, what this model is actually behaving, uh, behaving like. Um, now, but in addition, uh, these authors uh, have suggested that uh, this model could display uh, spin glass behavior. Yeah, I'm almost done. So we're exploring this question. So we're exploring uh, whether this model uh, displays this, and this could be due to the fact that when these fields uh, get a large web, they are choosing some direction in field space, and it gets stuck there and doesn't move around. Uh, um, now, this involves uh, solving the model with n replicas and then taking the n going to zero limit. Um, now, we can make a, so we can consider the problem with n replicas and then make a similar large uh, g-bar approximation, the same as what we were doing before. Um, and now you find that if you do that, you find that the effective action uh, contains uh, two terms. So wh when you do this uh, replica discussion, um, the, the functions that appear now have two, two indices that relate to the different a and b go from 1 to n, where, uh, 
where those are the end replicas, and you can have correlators across different replicas. So correlation functions also have an A and B index. Um, and so you can uh, scale this function g. So along the diagonal, you, um, you can say that this uh, constant value of g is, um, has a diagonal piece, which is what we call g bar, and then some off-diagonal pieces, uh, which uh, we are yet to be determined. So if you do that, then uh, you find that the full effective action is the same as what we had before. So this something that sums up to this that includes the effects of temperature and of the dynamics. Uh, of, of the modes that are not uh, constant, and then um, a, a function that depends only on the constant off-diagonal modes. So in, in all these situations, the, the off-diagonal modes are constant. Um, and in particular, they are temperature independent. So what this shows is that the effect of including replicas and uh, various patterns of possible replica symmetry, um, replica symmetry violation that you could have uh, will only affect the uh, ground state entropy, but not uh, the free energy, the, the, the free energy we discussed before. Um, now, we, we, are still, uh, we, are still, um, we are still trying to figure out what the actual minimum for what the actual pattern of symmetry breaking is. We haven't finished doing that. Um, but we haven't found uh, so far any uh, he any behavior like uh, spin glass for the moment, but maybe that could change. Uh, but some say conclusion is that uh, if if we find it, the uh, the only thing it could change is the ground state entropy. Now, in conclusions, we discussed the scaling similarity of the deep brain gravity solutions. We explained how it can be used to find the spectrum of fluctuations. And we explain how to get the similarity exponent from a supersymmetry computation uh, from the boundary theory. Uh, then we switch to an SYK-like model, which displays a scaling similarity at large n. And we explain some features of the solution of this model. So, um, and we are still working on a possible uh, spin glass phase. We, we haven't found it yet, if, if present. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. So, questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the dimension of operators, there was a factor of 1 over p minus 5. Yeah. In uh, the first half of the talk. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, what happens for d5 brains? This formula seems to diverge. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so for d5 brains, um, you you don't. What, what happens is that you should define your scaling differently, and um, what happens is that you are not really rescaling the coordinates, but you're only just changing the dilaton. So you, the the five brains still has the symmetry, but it's not a rescaling anymore. So so it should not be viewed as a rescaling of the coordinates, but just as a rescaling of the, of, of the value of the dilaton at the bottom, or just rescaling the dilaton, a shift of the dilaton. Do you have an understanding why this should be the case? Something that has to do with the little string theory, maybe? That uh, yeah, yeah, of course, the little string theory has this property. This is just the, like the boundary description. But in that case, we don't have an alternative uh, sort of uh, the UV description other than the little string theory. More questions? Now, I should mention that in one particular case, like the D4 brain, um, for the D4 brain, this uh, scaling similarity really comes from dimensionally reducing the ADS, uh, yeah, the, the ADS7. So in that case, that funny ADS with some funny dimension really becomes ADS7, yeah. Yeah, I ha we haven't thought of too much about the other case, the, the higher dimensional cases. Uh, six, okay. Yeah. I, I thought this yeah, sorry, yeah, the D6, uh, because that's just like flat space, and it's a rescale. That's another situation where it's simple, because it's a rescaling of flat space. Uh, so the, the geometry is just a uh, uh, quotient. What's of the relation? I had the same question that Nikolai yeah. had. Is there any relation with the thermodynamics of 
the of the five brains that is also different. Yeah, yeah. So in the thermodynamics of five brains, the 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 <coughs> The solution, the cigar solution, the usual cigar solution exists only for one beta, so you 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 don't change you don't change beta. But however, that solution has a kind of zero mode, which it can be, which is the value of the dilaton at the tip, and so so I think you, you still have some symmetry, but it's not it's not a rescaling. You shouldn't we call it a rescaling? It's just a, sh a change of the value of the dilaton at the tip. Um, so since the the dilaton runs, you sh you should have uh, some RG flow and. Uh does it run to any fixed point in the IR? So the this, this spin glass model that you're looking for? Uh, you're asking about the spin glass yeah, discussion? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, th there is no dilaton there. I mean, there is. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. But there's a. I mean, in so if there's a dual to be there, then. Uh, well, we 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 have not understood the yeah. the spin glass yeah. uh, behavior yet, but I think what it could do is it could reduce the 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 entropy because you are not. So this entropy is coming from somehow all the flat directions in the potential, yeah, and you might yeah. be selecting just one, some of them, not yeah, not all yeah. of them. So that's what it could do. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure it even does that. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Further questions? Are you looking for you are looking for spin glass behavior? Um, well, the the spin glass means that uh, the, the the theory has many minima or many yeah. regions that. Uh, if the fields get stuck in that minimum, they don't easily move to the other ones. So it's a kind of symmetry-breaking phenomenon. In the sort of spin liquid or standard SYK phase, the system explores the whole the, the whole phase. And so in this case, we haven't figured out what exactly it does. Yeah. Anything else? Well, if not, no, let's thank one again for okay. a very nice talk. <laughs>